Things are looking pretty grim right now for Theros. <music> Greetings, owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles. We are here today to discuss two different spoilers from the brand new Theros Beyond Death set. And things are getting pretty ugly in the world of Theros. Something that I thought wasn't going to happen did happen in that the Titans have escaped from the underworld. And we have a couple of Titanic cards to take a look at. So let's let's dive right in and start looking at them and talking about what's going on. What you see on the screen right now is Euro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. So what, what is the deal with these Titans? Well, basically what's happened is these Titans are essentially the predecessors to Theros' gods. And Theros' gods exist in a belief-based pantheon, essentially where they gain their power from the belief of the worshippers. They only exist because the people believe that they do. Now, the Titans, they were around before the gods existed, before the current setup of gods with Heliod and all those other fun boys, before they all existed, you had the Titans. And the Titans are more elemental and less sentient in a way than the gods are. The gods are more civilized. If you think about it from a, from a particular perspective, now this may or may not be the way that things boiled out on Theros, but essentially underneath it all, you have the current pantheon, which is worshipped by more civilized individuals. You have like your different towns like Miletus and things like that, where they properly worship the gods. Whereas the Titans come across as more elemental forces of nature. So they wouldn't particularly be perceived as having one individual form. You know, you would be like Titan of the wind or a, a nature Titan, some sort of some sort of concept that would be revered by probably more primitive style people. So essentially you would have the existence of the Titans because old, like way older generations of more primitive versions of the residents of Theros believed in these physical manifestation versions of like elemental forces. That's how I view the concept of the Titans. They are also birthed through belief, but it's a different scenario where instead of like, okay, this is a particular god with these particular attributes. It's more of this elemental nature that has particular attributes. So you can see that the Titan of Nature's Wrath, they're, they're more elemental, and in case you're wondering, they couldn't be destroyed by the gods. That's why they were chained in the underworld. So the first one we're going to look at is Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. One blue, one green, and one for a 6-6 elder giant now i like the i like the elder little sort of prefix creature type that they use here it's the same thing that we saw on the elder dragons and it does add a certain a certain little bit of it's just it's flavor in all honesty it's not something that they need to include on the card but it's to help transmit the concept of age right these precede the existence of gods on theros they they were there first and the Titans have a an interesting mechanical setup in that they aren't really allowed to exist in a normal fashion. They have to escape from the underworld in terms of magic play. So when Uro enters the battlefield, sacrifice it unless it escaped. It's pretty, pretty weird to see on a creature where basically, unless you cast it from the graveyard using a very specific ability, you have to sacrifice it right away. So you put it into play, sacrifice it, Whenever he enters the battlefield or attacks, you gain three life and draw a card. Then you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield. And then he escapes for two green, two blue, and exiling five other cards. So that's going to be the way you actually get to get him to stick around, is to pay his escape cost. Now, interestingly enough, before you end up paying for the escape cost, this guy functions more like a spell than a creature. He functions more like a sorcery spell specifically than a creature because you pay three mana, put him into the graveyard, and because he entered the battlefield, his entering the battlefield ability triggers and you gain three life and draw a card. So at first it's basically one blue, one green, and one colorless. Draw a card, gain three life, and you may put a land card 
from your hand onto the battlefield. So it's kind of like a variation of explore, really, if you break it down. And then once he returns, that's when you actually get the creature version of him. And I mean, 6-6 six, six is pretty beefy. You are paying a total of seven mana, unless there is another way that you fed him into your graveyard, right? There are other ways to get cards into your graveyard. I do like the fact that they, since they made it a requirement that he escapes, I like the fact that they gave you a way to get him into your graveyard. Yes, it is a little more expensive. I mean, overall, you're gonna have to pay seven mana and exile five cards, and that's a steep cost, but the guy's a beefcake, and he's, I mean, you're getting a 6-6 six, six body, and every time it attacks, it's going to trigger that ability. So once you bring him back, every time you're swinging with him, you're gaining three life, drawing a card, and can even do an extra land drop. And that's a lot of value per swing on top of having a 6-6 six, six body. And when we look at the artwork, you can see that he is basically almost the equivalent of, it feels like, like a typhoon, like a, a maelstrom out at sea. You can see what looks like his arms kind of striking down into the water. There's kind of a claw aspect to it. You can see boats are being smashed all up. The waters are this crazy kind of green color. I think that might actually be part of his actual essence there in the water or just the effect of their having this kind of storm. But his mouth has kind of um, like a whirlwind vortex kind of feel to it. Overall, he's got he's got an elemental feel. He definitely feels way more blue than green in this artwork. You know, I mean, although you could kind of say maybe his head looks like it's sort of made up of brambliness, but it honestly looks like he is just drawn up out of the water. It looks like he's a being made of water, but the artwork is itself green blue, so that helps to transmit it a bit. And you can see the boats being smashed up, the dudes running up the hill for scale. You can see how massive this creature is just towering over everything. And you can see another nice added detail that I like are the chains, because we saw these chained up in the Binding of the Titans saga. So you can see the Titans have broken their chains and are running amok on Theros. Now, I'm not sure exactly how many of these we get. I don't know if it's three, four, or five. It looks like there are four depicted in the Binding of the Titans. We have two of them, they, we have two of them spoiled here, and I actually really like that they kind of contrast and act almost as reflections of each other, not in terms of the specific flavor. As you'll see, we're talking about Croxa or Croxa, Croxa, Titan of Death's Hunger. And this is a red and a black. So when I said it, con you know what, actually, let me go through the card and then I'll talk about how it contrasts the other one. So a red and a black operates the same way. When it enters the battlefield, you sacrifice it unless it escaped. Whenever Croxa enters the battlefield or attacks, each opponent discards a card. Then each opponent who didn't discard a non-land card this way loses three life. Escape for two black and two red. So you can see there's a, a lot of similarity in terms of casting cost. You can see the escape costs are identical, just using different colors of mana. Overall, Croxa costs one less to cast. So when you play him, originally he's going to function as a red-black sorcery, essentially, that says your opponent discards a card, or each opponent, I should say. Each opponent discards a card, then each opponent who didn't discard a non-land card this way loses three life. Now, understand when you read that, that also counts people, because I know there's some confusion surrounding this kind of wording. This, when it makes your opponent discard, if they don't discard a card because they don't have one, that also counts as not discarding a non-land card. There are some people who thought, oh, if you don't have a card to discard, you don't take any damage, but that's not the case. So make your opponent discard a card, and I like the fact, I like how aggressive this is as discard, where it's basically like, a lot of the time when you hit somebody with a discard spell where they get to pick, they're going to pick a land. They're going to usually pick just like a basic land and pitch it into the graveyard because in most in most circumstances that's what they need the least so it's nice to see that if you have that disappointing moment where you play this discard on your opponent like no 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 you're not getting away with that get burned and that makes perfect sense from a red black perspective where black is bringing the discard and red is bringing essentially a lightning bolt straight to the face if you um if you don't discard and it's even actually better than a, a lightning bolt because it's loss of life instead of damage, and that's a lot harder to get around. You can prevent damage. Losing life isn't really a preventable sort of thing. So that adds an extra dimension to Croxa here. 
Now, overall, this card is pretty solid too. You get the same sort of like generating value. In a way, actually, I'm not sure which is grosser. Getting to just, I, you know what, honestly, yeah, I know it's grosser. Euro's grosser in terms of you get to draw an extra card each turn and gain life. Uh, the Crux is just basically going to make your opponent pitch, and then it just turns into an extra three damage a turn. So I think value-wise over time in a game that's going longer, you're probably going to get more value out of Euro, but Croxa is definitely a lot more aggressive. Now, when I talked about them kind of being a reflection of each other, well, blue and green are the colors of Uro. Croxa is black and red, which are enemy colors of green and blue. You've got the fact that when Uro comes out, basically you get to draw a card and you get to gain three life, right? And Croxa is essentially like pitch a card, lose three life. Now, obviously, they're not exactly the same in that regard, but it feels similar enough that it's a nice reflection. And when you take a look at their artworks, you'll actually notice they're both going in different directions. Like basically, one's facing off to the left, one's facing off to the right, just kind of like they're facing off against each other. I like that. Now, it's not a, it's not a perfect reflection, obviously. But still, or not reflection, but mirror, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. Either way, I just like the fact that you can, you can feel this sort of like, opposite effect on one's like i'm going to take take cards from you i'm going to make you lose life and the other's about getting cards and gaining life so i enjoyed that the artwork on croxa is pretty insane in all honesty he would be i mean the nature's wrath one's pretty simple that's just that's all of nature's wrath combined up into one titan right the titan of death's hunger it makes you think that croxa would have been the precursor to erebos right erebos has a very sort of structured underworld where every everyone and everything has its place are you a slacker well you're going to the you're going to slacker hell essentially those are the sort of setups that Erebos has and he maintains that kind of order but Croxa gives more of an uncaring kind of aspect where it's just like death's hunger with the fact that his head basically just looks like a gigantic gaping mouth ready to swallow whatever and his his stomach has a giant hole that could either be represented as a giant maw because of its ja jagged edges, like it's literally a second gigantic mouth in the belly, or it could be simply there to represent like the hole in the belly shows that this, this, this hunger can never be satisfied and he will constantly crave more death. And it also makes me wonder if back in the day when the Titans roamed the world before the gods took over, things that were consumed by death's hunger were they destroyed forever? Like, was there an underworld for them? Or was that the end of their existence? And again, Croxa looks massive, towering here, has the same kind of concept with the chains the, where they've escaped. I like that they're, it feels a little bit different than Uro's. Like, it almost feels like they're coming from a central location in this case, whereas Uro's are like spread all over the place. They all seem to be dangling from this guy's neck and in much like much longer chains. It's almost like ornamentation on him. This artwork's pretty impressive. I like the fact that he's at some gigantic temple and if you actually look way down below his one hand that's grasping the pillar, you can see a couple of people who are like kind of huddled and trying to hide to a degree, but there's no way, there's no way you're gonna escape this Titan's notice. And this crazy black miasma that is just like flowing off of him. You can see it flowing up off of his back and flowing around his feet as well. This is literally an elder titan. This is essentially the elemental force of death, which is insanely flavorful. So for me, these titans are incredibly cool, but they do pose a massive problem for Theros. I mean, you've got a situation where they were bound down in the underworld for a reason, and then you've got the gods who originally enslaved them down there, imprisoned them, I guess not really enslaved them because they're not doing anything with them, but imprisoned them down in the underworld. And now the Titans are free again. Are they going like, are they going to be able to put these Titans back in their place, back in the prisons, far, far, far away from regular folk just trying to live their lives? Or is Theros gonna be changed irrevocably by this? What's, what's gonna happen? Is Clothis going to manage to set everything right? Or is everything, just done for. I'm I'm genuinely interested to see how all of this is going to play out because we don't get all the information uh, about these stories, especially until the whole set comes out and we're given some extra flavor explanation from Wizards. I know there won't be a book for this, which will make it a little trickier, but either way, 
I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what's coming. So let me know your thoughts in the comments, my friends. Let me know what you think of these insane Titans and what might happen on Theros. I genuinely did not expect to see these Titans. Speaking of seeing things, released a hilarious new video on my second channel. Invite you to come and check it out and have a laugh. It's fantastic fun we're having over there. Thanks for coming by, everybody. Big shout out to my patrons and channel members. And remember, together we are the sixth color of magic.